Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. This is the next episode in the Jade Engine Devlog series. That's right. This is now the Jade Engine Devlog series because I'm having way too much fun working on the engine rather than working on a game. I want to have a solid engine and I figured that the unique twist I can put on my engine is a focus on teaching. So I want my engine to have all the teaching utilities embedded in it. I want it to have easy access to find documentation for every single component. I want the user of the engine to be able to know what the engine can do. All too many times I found myself using Unity or Unreal and you're trying to do something and you just start coding it because that's what we do. We're coders, we're programmers, we like to code. And then you start coding a feature and then a few weeks into it, you realize, oh, there's already a feature in the engine that handles this for me. But I didn't know about it because I had to go through the package manager or some other thing or whatever. And so I figure I can try and combat that with my engine by having very strict tutorials. Well, not strict, but very informative tutorials, links, uh, lots of info bubbles and everything that take you right to the documentation and a helpful search bar where you can actually search for features and everything and it tells you whether it has it and if it does how it works and stuff so i want this to be really heavily focused on teaching on allowing the user of the engine to know exactly what the engine can do and if they want to do lower capability stuff such as you know creating meshes or something manually in the code i'll let them do that i'll expose the engine functionality that's another thing with Unreal and Unity that I found a little bit difficult is just trying to create a mesh and uploading some images to it. It's kind of hard to do and it shouldn't be because it's something that you want to do in a game like Minecraft or something. So yeah, Jade Engine, this is what it's going to be. Now, it's only been a day since I released the last devlog, but I've already implemented gizmos, which are the things that you use to move around objects and stuff. And I am now sketching out a design for a resource system. So. I'll show you the gizmos real quick, and then I will show you the designs that I've sketched out roughly, very roughly, for my resource management system or my asset management system, and then I'll take you along as I go to code these things. I'll very briefly show you guys the little gizmo system I have up and running, and then I'll show you sort of the code that I came up with. Gizmos are kind of annoying. There's not a lot of resources out there that teach you how to make them, probably because people think that it's intuitive when, when you're a newbie like me, it's not intuitive. And so it's nice to know how these things work. But anyhow, this is my gizmo system. So you see, I've got the little free move. I've got the drag and then I can click uh, S and it'll change to free scale or scale horizontal vertical. This is super nice. Um, one thing I'm considering changing possibly. So you'll notice when I scale the bounding box on this object scales with it. But if you look down here, the size remains the same. And that could be a little confusing because the box size is actually changing. It's actually the scale. So if we look at the scale, it's the scale times the initial settings. So if I was to set this to one, this is uh, the scale to one. This is the initial scale of this box, but this is actually not what it ends up being in the final product. So may consider changing that, but yeah. Um, so. The gizmos work just like you would expect. I don't have rotate done yet, and that's part of the reason I'm doing my management system, but you can see if I click on the other objects, it works. I can undo and redo changes with these. Uh, works just the same. So yeah, it's good. It works. Now, I'll very briefly show how I did this. If you guys want further info on this, feel free to suggest it in the comments, and I could start doing some tutorials, little early tutorials on stuff like this, because like I said, there's no resources. <laughs> I had to look very far to find stuff about this. So I opted for a very simple way of doing this. Uh, I treat the gizmos as if they were a system in my entity component system. They don't actually use entities or components, but I figured I called this gizmo controller initially. So I had it like this. I was like, a controller is just a system. Um, I'm going to leave that as system. And so, yeah, this became the gizmo system. And what I do is I have this little gizmo class, which is like the gizmo object, and it has gizmo manipulate translate, rotate, and scale, which takes the transform of the object you're manipulating. It takes um, a couple parameters to help me out with like figuring out where to set things, so like the original position that the mouse was clicked on when it started doing this manipulate translate, and then the mouse is offset from the gizmo when that was clicked, stuff like that. The gizmo object itself takes in a sprite, um, and then some other parameters to define how to draw it and how to draw it when it's hovered and all that type of stuff. 
And then I basically just have this very simple, I have an update method and inside that update method, I basically check and see if the gizmo is hot or active. So I have these variables and that just means that the mouse is hovering or you're actually engaging with the gizmo. And then if you are and the user presses the mouse button, then I enable this mouse dragging to let me know it's dragging it. And then I calculate all the stuff that you need for that. So yeah. And I just have this little gizmos array that contains it. It's a union with an array and then I can access this them each gizmo individually here if I want to. This was kind of annoying to implement too because I actually had to implement a render system change. So basically I had no way to debug draw sprites and that's sort of how I was going to actually enable drawing my gizmo sprites. So I say debug draw add sprite and then it takes the texture and all the appropriate coordinates, uh, texture coordinates too, because so, it's a sprite sheet that I'm pulling from. And then it just adds it in like an immediate mode style debug drawing manner. And in order to do this, I refactored my whole <laughs> batching system so that batches are completely decoupled from the rendering system so I can use batches in debug drawing and regular drawing. So lots of changes, but it worked out good. And once again, the gizmos work fine. And you'll also notice that they scale with the camera zoom, which is also nice. I was debating whether to do it or not, and I'm glad I did because it helps. Okay, resource management. So you'll notice none of these have any sprites on them, and that's because I don't have a good way to import sprite sheets, and it's really annoying to do it in code. So I want to automate that through my engine. How? I have been reading in my game engine architecture book written by the developers, some developers at Naughty Dog, and uh, looking through how they did their resource management and everything. And this is a huge part of an engine. It should work well because if you import sprite sheets and stuff, um, 3D models and everything, there's a specific dependency tree that you have to create and everything because 3D models depend on materials and textures and everything. And then for sprite sheets even, if you import a sprite sheet, typically you're not done developing the game when you import the sprite sheet. And so you're going to add more stuff to the sprite sheet. And you have to, if you have to like re-split and like re-splice it every single time and do all that manually, it's annoying really fast. That's one of the things in Unity too that I got really annoyed of. So I'm gonna start working on this. I'll update you guys once I have some interesting stuff going on. Hey guys, it has been a long and arduous week in which I have been doing a lot of stuff. So one of the things that you can notice right away is the UI is completely changed. I'm not sure if I quite like it. Let me know if you guys like this. Um, I'm actually trying to design it myself, so I'm sort of switching it up and everything. I think I like this, but I still can't tell if I do or not. So it's bound to change in the future. And UI takes forever. Like, it just stinks how hard it is to come up with a nice ui design like i spent hours trying to design it didn't like it and then i had to keep tweaking things because the way i'm gui works and everything but that's besides the point i have some really cool features that are working now so if i go here and if i click down to here i can switch into my texture browser so my texture browser is basically the textures that are loaded for this scene and you see that i've got this uh, sprite sheet that i've loaded through the code and then this is the gizmos sprite sheet and so then if I drag this up into my default sprite in my sprite render, you'll notice that the sprite actually changes up here. And so this is more accentuated. Let's import a sprite like this. And then I will drag and drop this into here. And now I have, if I make this bigger, a new sprite in my scene. <laughs> this is so cool. I am so happy with the way this is working. Like I could not be happier and one of the things if you try and re-import this sprite it's not going to let you because you've already imported it and i'll actually get a warning up here it says try to load an asset that's already been loaded which is really cool and so then you can of course load more assets so if i load this one in and then i want to change it to this instead i'll change it to that and then maybe i want to change this guy to uh the sprite over here so that i can just drag this up here and it all works just like you would expect and yeah, I'm just super happy with 
the way things are going. This is turning into an actual engine. I still got to work out some of the tweaks with the UI and everything and fix some stuff. And of course, I don't have sprite sheets enabled yet. So I can't actually like click onto here. What I want to be able to do is click this and then inspect it over here and turn it into a sprite sheet like Unity. But I don't have that option yet. This is great though. I'm so happy. I diverged a lot from the initial plan that I had. Let me show you how my UI or my asset system is basically working right now. So if I go into my asset manager, uh, you can see that we've got a couple of things. And so I found a link to something that I really liked. Um, I can't even remember the link now, but it was basically just a sort of a prototype of like how you could do an asset management system. And the way it works is you have these things called asset handles. So this is like an asset handle, which basically contains some metadata. It just tells you what type of asset it is, which I get using Ents uh, meta type info thing. So basically like texture is a type, audio is a type, those types of things. Uh, tells you the scene. So which scene this is located in gives it a unique resource ID so you can load it by ID and then it also stores the path to the actual texture and it tells you whether it is loaded or not. And so this loaded flag is particularly useful because if I get an asset that it has not been loaded yet, I can check and I can display a pink texture or something like that if I want to. Now we use these assets and these are sort of our container types and then what ends up happening is actually if I go in like texture.h you'll notice that texture extends asset. So it is a type of asset. And then I basically just on construction, give it a unique ID by calling generate ID and everything. And you can go ahead and do whatever you want with the texture as if it was an asset. Now, the asset manager is sort of where these get managed, right? The asset manager has, if we go down here, a map that goes from a UN32 to another map that goes from UN32 to an asset. And these are our assets. And so if you look at this, this is sort of what it's defining. It goes from scope or scene. So this is like the scene the asset is located in to an asset ID, which points to an asset. And this is useful because if you're switching scenes, you don't want to unload assets that you're going to need in the next scene. So this will allow you to just unload assets that won't be in the next scene and then load assets that you will need in the next scene. And then we also store the current scene, I'm not actually using the resource count yet. I might use that, which is just sort of like the count of how many assets we have in general. Then we have some helper functions. Basically, we can get all assets or we can get all assets of a type. So this will like get me, if I call this, you can see in here I have an example where I say get all assets of type texture and this will get me all the texture types and then I can sort of iterate through those, which is what I do for my texture browser. And then I also have a few more functions. Uh, you can get an asset by the resource ID or get an asset by its path or by a path. This is slower. You always want to use the resource ID if you can. And then this function load texture from file, which calls a virtual function, uh, which is basically just like a abstract function in Java. And it'll just call the load function on the subtype. This isn't implemented. It gets implemented inside of something like texture where we have this load, which is overriding the other one. So that's sort of the asset management system. And it works good. It's scene independent, so it will only load assets that are necessary for a particular scene, which is pretty nice. And then that way, too, I can know when you're in the editor how to get like previews and everything, because I know if this asset is in the editor, then presumably you're going to be using it in your scene. And you'll notice, too, when I reopen the scene, it's not loading the assets down here immediately. I have to change that so that it actually saves those, but it's pretty close. Now, there's a lot of other stuff that I did that you're just not seeing here, such as uh, I created a file handling system and a path system so that I can concatenate paths and everything and uh, get that all independent. And that was a lot of work that just felt like I was getting nowhere. And then I finally got this up and running in just a couple days. So I guess that's game development for you, right? You spend so much time on these things that seems like you're not really getting anything done. And then all of a sudden you get a huge amount of progress in one day. But I am really happy with where this is going. I'm gonna make a script browser pretty soon here, tidy some things up in my code, fix some things that are not so well, actually get this scene hierarchy working. So that's sort of my goals for the next devlog is to get this scene hierarchy so that it's actually working and then clean up some of the things that I have not working right in my code and get scripts into this thing so that you can actually use scripts which will be super cool 
But that is it for this devlog. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It will be a little bit until my next devlog because I'm moving in a couple weeks. So that will take some time that I could be coding out. <laughs> but you guys will hopefully see that devlog pretty soon. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks.